Thank you, everyone, for contributing to Drupal in any way and for making Drupal what it is today. Drupal is people, Drupal is contribution, Drupal is community, and Drupal is technology. And Drupal 8 is made by us for you. Yeah, right? Yes. Deal? Doing. Welcome to the Acquia podcast. Drupal technology, community, and business. Welcome to the Acquia podcast, Drupal technology, community, and business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. Thank you. <laughs> so, a um, couple more topics. And, um, like I said, quick answers. Okay. I'll try. <laughs> uh, there, there are uh, several questions that all revolve around what's the main thing you learned? What's your regret? What would you do, do differently? Like, what, what did you learn? Like, in the broadest possible brushstrokes, what did you learn from the Drupal 8 uh, development cycle? Uh, there's a lot of things we've learned, and we've actually made a lot of changes as we were learning. Like, um, you know, there's a lot of process changes that we've made, um, you know, policies that we put in place to optimize things as we go. But to pick out one, and it's just one, but one of the biggest things we did in Drupal 8 is this idea of initiatives. Um, we didn't have initiatives before Drupal 8, and so we launched several initiatives like, um, you know, configuration management was an initiative, we had a mobile or HTML5 initiative, we had all of these initiatives. And overall, they've been very successful. Um, but what we've learned there, for example, is that the initiatives that were the most successful were initiatives that were run by, let's say, cross-functional teams versus one individual. Um, and so that's an important learning. Um, and that's not something that we could really change throughout the Drupal 8 cycle, development cycle, but that will definitely take into, um, you know, into the post-Drupal 8 world. You know, I'd like to do initiatives again, but we would structure them a little bit different. So Daniel Vayner wants to know, originally it was two different questions, but Daniel Vayner wants to know, how do we slow down now to reduce burnout as we go into Drupal 8.1 and how do we bring the fun back? Yeah, <laughs> um, well, it's a great question. Um, and the topic of burnout is very, uh, is, and it's difficult. It's a difficult topic. and. I'm not an expert on that topic, but my initial reaction would be we have to keep going. We have to keep innovating Drupal because, as I mentioned, we don't have the luxury of, you know, just doing nothing because the world around it's, us it's not done now. is moving so fast. So we have to find ways to keep innovating at the same time to address, um, you know, his concerns. It doesn't have to be the same people that keep doing all the work and it doesn't have to be the same people doing even more work. And so we have to find systems or a way of working that allows us to keep our pace of innovation going, but at the same time gives people a break and make sure that people can work in a sustainable and healthy way. And just that one more thing, um, it's often, here's the thing with burnout, it's often people themselves that have to change. It's not actually it's not, I don't know what we can do in Drupal that would fundamentally change that. The challenge here is that these people in our community are so committed, they're so passionate, they're so driven that they are unable to, you know, take a break. And a lot of it is with you deciding as an individual that, you know what, I need to take a little break. I need to reduce how much time I spent. I need to go to a healthier state. And so, in my mind, I try to decouple these, like the pace of innovation of Drupal and the pace that an individual works at in our community. So on the moving to the front of contribution, there are people like uh, Laurie Escola and Tiffany Ferris who talk a, lot, to talk a lot about spreading out the base of contribution, really, really enabling more and more people. Right. And I think we've got some great um, momentum in Drupal, the, the Drupal community onboarding and mentoring process that's grown up with, with Jess Murbo and Kathy Thays and Ruben Tejero and, right. Laura, and all those people, like the whole mentoring community. And I, 
all of you, I don't, you know, <laughs> lots and lots of names. Right. Um, it's, it's, they're so great, right? right? And um, I think that uh, having more people able to do more would help. On the other hand, of course, you and I know it's really, really hard to let go. We are actually oh, yeah. having fun and we're excited. So exactly. it's, it's, a, it's a tough transition to it's make. It's very hard. Um, but I think Drupal has a great architecture that allows a lot of people to contribute to the project. I mean, we have 30,000 active contributors. Like the architecture and the modularity allow people to contribute and to allow us to work at scale with a lot of people. Having said that, there are parts in core which are really hard, that we don't have enough people that actually know these things inside out. And as a result, a lot of people, you know, in the core developer community take, you know, take mm. these things really personal and, and take real ownership of this, which is which is wonderful. Um, but it also risks, you know, burning them out. So there the challenge is how can we get more people into the core developer community such that, you know, uh, we can spread the, the workload a little bit better. And it's something that I've been very passionate about. I mean, I've dedicated a whole keynote to that in Amsterdam, and I've you know, been writing about it a lot, and I've helped other people get hired as core developers. Um, you know, obviously we've hired a lot of those in Acquia, but also helped, helped coach other companies on how to hire core developers so we can have a more manageable work-life balance for, for these people and bring more people into the fold. My my hope and my gut feeling as well is now that Drupal is much less idiomatic and much more standardized and up to date in terms of coding practices, um, object orientation, and and that that it's actually open for a lot more people to do more. Yeah, was... And I've been having really really promising conversations with a lot of people out in PHP land about that, and they're they're actually really really interested. So maybe maybe we can uh, win some win some of them yeah, as well. No doubt that that's gonna be a, a big help there. So, all about contribution now. John Faber wants to know how do we invigorate uh, the contributed module space and get, get upgrades to Drupal 8 happening? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think it's a great question and there's not a quick answer here. <laughs> I know you want quick answers, but I, I think ultimately, if you think about how adoption happens, it's, you know, people, websites, organizations that say, I want to use Drupal 8. And, and a lot of that um, triggers, you know, agencies, Drupal shops to, you know, help port modules. So that's part of the dimension here. Um, the other part is just individuals that say, I'm going to, you know, contribute and, and upgrade this module. So, um, and we can help those, all of those with better documentation. It's something that's missing today, to be honest. Um, we can do much better around documentation and providing guidance on how to upgrade modules. Um, you know, fortunately, people are working on, on that documentation. There is at least 15 books being written right now about Drupal 8 as well, which is, which is going to be awesome too, to have those released. So, um, you know, I think for people like John, you know, who runs a Drupal shop, it is selling Drupal 8 to his customers and in the process of delivering a Drupal 8 project, you know, helping to port modules. Right, and, and, and investing some of his profit margin into uh, getting the platform in a state where he can then right. do more projects faster with it, I guess. Exactly. And I guess that's the answer for everyone involved in, in the ecosystem, clients, customers, agencies, right. everybody. John Faber also asks, um, and loaded question, but should Drupal shops hire core contributors? I think so. Um, and let's see how much detail I want to go, but I think, you know, John runs chapter three and he did a blog post recently. I don't know if that's why it's loaded or not about the impact they've seen from hiring Alex Poth, which is one of the you know core contributors, core committers. Um, you know, and it, it really helps um, when these core contributors spend some of their time helping to do basically marketing and sales support. And it has to be, it can be, you know, as little as half a day a week where they're on calls with some customers, where they do podcasts or blogs. And, you know, if you can convert a percentage of those, you know, visitors that read these things or listen to these podcasts, they can be really adding up, you know, in terms of growing your revenues. And then there's also the effect internally 
with your with your staff, with your employees, to have somebody that's very knowledgeable about the next version of Drupal on staff, and you know, educate the rest of the organization, uh, get people excited about you know what's coming, and all of these things. So I think there's a lot of reasons why you should hire a core developer, and I think it's great that we have examples like Chapter Three, and then we have people like John making those bets because we have to demonstrate to the world that this actually makes a lot of sense and that it can really help drive their business. And we're starting to see that now with um, some of the companies that have hired core developers. So hopefully that will inspire others to do the same. John and I had a couple of podcast conversations about this as well. And um, of course, it's uh, really, really hard for agencies. And I think especially in the last couple of years where there's been a lot of sort of waiting for Drupal 8 and pipelines have been challenging. It's really, really hard for a company, let's say anything up to 100 people, it's really, really hard to justify every non-revenue generating hire, right? Right. That's a challenge. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that John is talking about it because he's surviving in a very expensive market. So it, it clearly shows that it's possible. Um, on the other hand, Tiffany, for example, in Chicago with Palantir, uh, thinks that maybe having one person dedicated to contribution and throwing all your sort of budget there uh, could create envy or, or imbalance along the, through your teams mm -hmm. where individuals could be also contributing and sort of feeling like, oh, I have to do my job and I still mm -hmm. have to contribute. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, there's pros and cons to both models. Um, like where as Drupal, we need help with some of the harder problems and they're hard to solve if you only get you know four hours a week to contribute to Drupal so to solve some of these problems we need like dedicated people frankly um, and you know the context switching and, and all of these things gets eliminated if you have you know a lot of time to dedicate so um, at the same time I definitely uh, see uh, Tiffany's point like you know um, a lot of people want to contribute to Drupal 8 and you want to make, make it a fair system, so to speak, for all of your employees. Um, so I can see that as well. And a lot of, depending on what you contribute, you're, you might be able to do that in, you know, three, four hours a day. Uh, sorry, a week. <laughs> um, you can also, there's also other ways to do it. Like, you know, you could say, you, you know, you save up all of your time and then you get one week to spend on contributing versus you know, sort of a, a chopped up model. That's a great um, idea. So I think companies should experiment and, and should use the strategy that works for them. Okay. You know, I don't think there's a right or wrong here. And I um, think. And I personally like to hear about what people are doing that, that is working for you and, and, and maybe things that didn't work for you. And if we can share that with, with, with the community, I, I think we could also help right. make progress. So um, the last sort of group of questions here um, revolves around for example, Larry asks, what's the future of non-regularly funded core contributors? Are they a dying breed? Or will the core slow down and now let them back in? Daniel Vayner asks, uh, why does it seem that nobody gets paid to maintain Drupal only to add new features to it? Um, and Daniel I don't think that's true, by the way. Okay. Um, anyway, first of all, I think if you think about how comp systems evolve from sort of born out of volunteerism to, you know, important systems that the world relies on. And there's a lot of them um, outside of software. There are, you know, schools were created because somebody thought, hey, let's teach the kids in our town. <laughs> and school system then evolved into something nationwide in pretty much every country in the world. And clearly the school system can't ru be run anymore based on volunteers, right? You need you know, you need to institutionalize how you run schools to get consistent results and, you know, reliable system. And the same thing is true for infrastructure, like roads were built because, you know, a person wanted to go from A to B. And then commercial interest came and actually invested a lot in roads because a lot of the toll roads, or well, the roads were toll roads, so you had to pay. And a company was making money to make the roads. Those proprietary roads. That's right. And eventually, that was institutionalized as well, and it's now gov you know, run by governments, whether it's federal government or a local government. Um, the military, the same thing, you know, was very ad hoc to let's defend our village. 
to, you know. So and so there's this evolution of things starts are started by volunteers and then get bigger and bigger and more and more complex and more and more important for society that they have to be maintained by full-time people. And I think it's just the nature of the beast. That doesn't mean that there is no room for volunteers. You know, I think, you know, typically where volunteerism shines is around the edges, you know, where there's a lot of sort of untapped things to explore and all of these things. So um, I think it's a little bit natural. And so, you know, we, we can't deny what's, you know, sort of these big trends. At the same time, you want to continue to attract volunteers by, um, and, you know, I definitely encourage them to experiment around the edges, even the edges in core. I mean, there's a lot of different things people can do. Um, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, a lot of the core developers that are being paid, you know, especially the ones on my team, they are, you know, helping to maintain things. Like they're not just innovating things. I mean, we spent the last two years, frankly, not adding features. We've spent the last two years with a team of five people fixing bugs, maintaining things, putting things in place for the Drupal 8 release, helping to raise money, helping to allocate money in Drupal 8 Accelerate. I mean, we've done a lot of sort of blocking and tackling, maintenance-like work versus going to build the next spark or the next you know big thing. So, Also extending the metaphor a little bit about public services, uh, there are great traditions of volunteer um, lifeguards and and no. fire uh, fighters and and um, you know other things and I think so so I think you're saying there's absolutely room for anybody who wants to jump in to Drupal at any level right. and um, and there's also a really natural professionalization of the ecosystem right. going on which is simply a consequence also of our size and sort of right. economic consequence and it, yeah and I think what people have to understand it's it's not a bad thing you know it is what it is and like in any society there's room for volunteers in different pockets you know left and right <laughs> and then there is there is a need for you know professionalism to use your word so cool hey thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this um happy birthday congratulations on drupal 8.0.0 is there anything that you still want to uh get off your chest not really. I'm Not just, really? Just happy. Go port modules. <laughs> Go port modules. All right. Also, hey, right. Trace, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. All right. Maybe, Jam, you can do it first. That helps me if you're a pre actor. We can I'm read it here. there. We can read it. Can you read it big enough? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Stand here, stand yeah, you, have to, you have to like to stand like, like a little bit like this. Just a little bit wider no, because now you're yeah. like, this is... So then, and you do my arms, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so actually, put your arms here. Do it like that. <laughs> Drupal is people. Drupal is contribution. Drupal is community. Drupal is technology. <laughs> Drupal 8 is made by us for you. Thank you, everyone who contributed in any way to making Drupal what it is today. <laughs> you should, you should All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's see it again. <laughs>